alive. I'm just reading, I'm reading in Luke. I, I opened it before I picked up the paper to know what you were teaching on this one. Right. And it's, I'm reading about the foretelling of John, the birth of John the Baptist. And I wonder if I was in the temple, or if I was sitting here over in that room, and an angel came to me, I wonder if I would be frightened. Right, and it's kind of some of the messages today. Yeah, I mean, how would we? How would we react if something that showed up? You'd be, you might be shaking in your britches, or you might, whoa. You know, so it would be a, a difficult thing to grasp, and that's why she pondered these things later uh, when the uh, wise became and, the, and, 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 you know, everything else at that point. She was contemplating, pondering, like, wow, you know, this is, this is, you know, what's she thinking? This is just way over that more than I thought I was going to expect when I was betrothed to Joseph. And yet, uh, you know, this thing's happened. Welcome. Come on in. And I forgot my hearing aid. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> It'll be good to hear, yes. It's a good thing we live right here. Yes. All right. We got a few minutes. I want to make sure that's my phone looks crooked, it's but I don't know. If it, yeah. But I don't know. Make sure that uh, we're not crooked like I one time. Yeah. The, there we go. I think that's pretty good. I don't know. I haven't seen Kathy. She was was here last week, yeah. Oh, or maybe Kathy she... is going to her sister's church. Oh. Um, she's playing um, the handbells. Okay. And um, they were supposed to play this morning, I believe. Okay. I they played last week. I'm not sure. Right. We have in the church people play those bells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many churches do, but we don't. In this church, no, we don't have no handbells. In other ones, we've had it. National Baptist had it, I think. And, uh, where else they had it? You sure look a very comfortable. No, I think it's over in the um, library. In the library. Possibly. But they don't want us adjusting it. Right. And I had they gave me the remote so I had turned on the fan on the fireplaces and stuff and <laughs> they were complaining it was warm and they went for glowing uh -huh. did something and it wasn't quite what it was. <coughs> now for me, it's a little chilly in here, but oh. I've been running around up the stairs and setting things up. Yes. That's why. Yes. Now I can hear. My assistant pastor here. You're my assistant pastor. <laughs> he said he can preach, but in sometimes. Oh, that's great. He has a nursing home in other places. He would mention he would once in a while preach the word. Adjust that. All right, well, we got about, uh, well, it's about uh, 20 seconds. I'm pretty accurate. I like to be punctual when it comes to starting a church. And for those who will be watching live from all over the world, potentially, and we've had people from different parts of the world watch these in previous sermons, they are on YouTube as well. Um, they're on the website at believerstogether.org. Since we are believers together, and so, uh, and the website is believetogether.org. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll just start now, since it's about 11 a.m., and that is 8 a.m. Western uh, Pacific time, where we have viewers from the previous church that I've overseen in Baja, California, Mexico, in San Felipe, 
And so there are people all the way from there who watch it as well. But so, good morning to those around the world and some people who are like in Romania, my ex-associate pastor. Good evening to him. He's seven, six hours ahead. No, it's really good afternoon, excuse me. So welcome all, Boston Live Stream, welcome there who are here physically. Uh, we're glad we are starting a new series today on the birth of Christ. The season is here, which is, this is the season to say happy birthday Jesus, basically. Um, so um, we are going to be starting a three-part series today, starting part one, which will be the birth of Christ series, a good news message of salvation and peace. And the second subtitle is the heavenly choir preached a message. And so, uh, and of course, these handouts, you're welcome to get them at BelieversTogether.org for the handout. And you also can get it at uh, fa Facebook.com forward slash San Felipe Believers. Um, that's from the old church that was in San Felipe. So then you can get this and you can print it out or use it on your iPad. It's got all the information uh, from all the different song handouts, the songs, the message, some sermon points, closing song. Then if you want to give a tithe and love offering as we continue to serve the Lord and pick up things we need to as we go by paper, admin, stuff. You can do that. There's a box here located in the back that you can put some offering in and also you can do it online using Zelle or PayPal or you can send a check, whatever, to the address that's on there that's ready to hear. So anyway, that's the handout for you all. And also remember on there, there's a list of prayer requests. So if you do have any prayer requests, you can send them to me at rtarasiak at gmail.com. Or oh, we have the cards back here physically located Right in the offering box, we have uh, prayer request cards. You can use that for any kind of prayer you might have. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays and other days when I, I do prayer, I will pray for those needs for sure. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, speaking of that, we go to Bible studies at 1 o'clock Eastern Time online. All that information is at the website as well, it believes together.org. Then we have handouts with questions, and we go verse by verse through books. And we're starting this Tuesday, 1 Thessalonians. We're going to start that book, and on Thursday at 1, and on Thursday at 1, we're continuing in Isaiah, we're going to be Isaiah chapter 54, so we welcome you to come, no, 55, excuse me, we finished it before last Thursday, so we welcome you all to come join us, we have about 10 people or more that interactive live video streaming online, you can use your iPad, your iPhone, your computer, as long as you've got a microphone and a, and a you know, the screen where you can see us on the different boxes we have online, and you can watch each other. And we interact, and, and you know, we've got people again from Romania, from Mexico, from, uh, um, um, what is it, Oregon, Oregon uh, all over the place, uh, New Hampshire, they come and join our Bible study, so it's fun. And using God's, te the technology for God's purpose and His glory as we come together and study the Word of God, so it's really a blessing to do that. And uh, previous sermons you can find on BelieversTogether.org, there's a sermons tab, uh, as well as YouTube. And uh, going back, I've done series on the Acts of the Apostles, 72 parts. So there's a lot of sermons there. We recently did 1 Peter. We just finished 2 Peter. And uh, eventually, what might be, I'm going to see if we go to the potentially, we might go into 1 Thessalonians from here, but we'll see. But uh, again, uh, if you have any prayer requests or anything that you want to put in your heart or if you need counseling, call me anytime. The number's on there as well on the website and on the handout. Uh, I'm here to serve 24-7, so whatever your needs are as a pastoral care, I'm here for you. So uh, let's just start opening in prayer, and uh, let's just let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house, to come together to worship you, to thank you, and to be part of this wonderful celebration of the birth of your Son, the Savior, Jesus Christ, who was in the beginning, but yet came down to the earth incarnate through a vessel, Mary, that was uh, full of grace, and uh, she loved the Lord, and, and of course, you came into this world to give us an example of a suffering servant as the Most High God incarnate in the flesh. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come together to worship you, to give you honor, praise, and glory, knowing that our salvation is not in vain, it is real. And as 1 John 5, 13 says, we know we have eternal life. And so we are grateful, Father, that we can trust in you and lean not on our own understanding. We thank you for this time. And Lord, also for those who are dealing with both physical battles and spiritual battles, Father, we lift up to you those needs of your church, that, and especially in this world, especially for the peace of Israel. And Father, the things going on in that war and those things, Lord God, we just ask for your to help and your mercy upon all those situations we have in our own personal lives, 
as well as those around us, our neighbors and friends and families we know, who need to even hear the gospel this time of this season of Christ's birth. So Lord, we just lift that up to you, and we thank you that you know, we know that you hear our prayer. And we thank you, it's because we have one mediator, and that's your son, Jesus Christ, between God and men. But love you, Father, let this service be a time to honor you, that our joy may be complete, and that we have focused upon the eternal things, the kingdom of God. And we do pray this all in Christ's name. Amen and amen. All right. We're going to first sing, we're going to do some Christmas carol, Christmas songs. We're going to start off first with Joy to the World, the Lord Has Come, right? Joy to the world. That's why we come together, because of His wonders of His love, and we have this great joy inside of us, knowing that greater is He than us, than He is of the world. And we have the victory in Jesus, so we can come together and say, Hey, oh come, all ye faithful. And that's our next song. Oh come, all ye faithful.
Spanish that El es fiel, that means he is faithful, he is full of faithfulness. And so, uh, and when it comes to that, well, we know that they were uh, kings of Orient, Dar that came. It doesn't say it was three, but in this song it says we three. They assumed just because they burned frankincense, incense, and myrrh in the other one, that there was supposedly three, but that doesn't mean it, just to say kings came. So, but anyway, we three kings of Orient, Dar, bearing gifts, we traverse so afar. Let's sing this song before we get to the message. It's a weird echo in here. It feels like I'm like an echo too. It sounds funny. I don't know why that is. It would be even worse if we were out in the village. Yeah. Well, it might be the natural reverb, but this one sounds just weird in my ears today. For some reason. <clears throat> we three kings of Orient. We three kings of Orient. Of, of the, for the Lord God and what a blessing it is to know that 
We have a God who cares for us, who, who is merciful, who gives us his blessings in our lives. And we truly are so blessed to be alive even, that we can come together even to come worship here in this building or some places like in China and Africa and underground churches where they cannot publicly come together and, um, and worship the Lord and even have Bibles. So uh, we are so fortunate here in the United States that we do have the, uh, the, the Bill of Rights, the first, uh, first Bill of Rights amendment where it says we have freedom of, of speech and to worship our Lord and Creator. So again, this is there. We start a new series, a three-part series, and this is part one of the Birth of Christ series, uh, as I call it, Happy Birthday Jesus. And so uh, the title of the message is A Good News Message of Salvation and Peace, and the text will be, this morning will be in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Dr. Luke wrote this, we know that Dr. Luke also wrote the book of Acts of the Apostles as well. And so, again, this title is A Good News Message of Salvation and Peace. And the Heavenly Choir Preached a Message. And as you're turning there to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, um, you know, when it comes to the holiday season, for many people, believe it or not, uh, one, it's one of the most depressing times of the year for a lot of people when it comes to this Christmas or season of Christ's birth. In fact, the suicide rate is higher between Thanksgiving and New Year's than any other time during the year because of that. And so it's easy to get caught up in the preparations and the festivities and even the pain we may feel in our hearts during the holidays that we forget the real meaning of the season. And of course, it's not about the gifts and the trees and decorations. It, 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 it isn't even about families and parties and fun. And it certainly is not about Santa Claus, snowmen, elves, and reindeers. It is truly all about Jesus and all about Him alone. And so as we challenge everyone here this morning, as well as those watching online, the reason of the season is the Christ, the Mashiach, the Christos in Greek of Christ. And it's Him who came down to this world to help us to discover the truth and to really see the fact that how humbly He came and so we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to look at this in a few minutes uh, today. And really, we, what we need to do right now is, is this. We need to leave our world behind and visit once again this little town of Bethlehem, and let's let Jesus transform our celebration of the birth of Christ. You know, the night God became flesh and walked among men ranks as one of the greatest moments in human history, if we think about it, Right? It was a night of tremendous miracles and great blessings. It was the night when God moved into the world to live and eventually to die. And through the story, though the story is just over 2,000 years old, it was a night of tremendous miracles and great blessings. It was the night, again, to remember that he would eventually go to the cross and die. But it's still fresh to me as if they were the first time I had ever read this or heard this story. So let's visit Bethlehem again today. And notice that as Mary delivered Jesus into this world and the deeper message in the birth of Christ. So again, a good news message of salvation and peace. Let's read in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And this is God's holy word. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and earn a peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this message. We thank you that you are sovereign. You are in control. And Father, you know the reason for all things. We stand upon your plan, your purpose, in your life, sometimes not understanding things and why they happen in our lives. But Father, help us to lean not on our own understanding, we trust in you, Father God, 
And Father, use me to speak as an oracle of God, this message of truth of the birth of Christ and the announcement and the proclamation of salvation and peace. And Father, help all those who are watching or listening even here today and watching that you prepare their hearts to receive this message and help us to grow in our relationship with the Lord and help those who don't have a relationship, Father, that you would draw them to your truth and let them even receive the gift of salvation today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. First point is this. This message that Luke has given is what is called, it's a comforting message. It's on your handout on the back under the sermon points. The first point is this. It's a comforting message. Well, think about this. Let me ask you a question. What is your greatest fear? What are the things that you fear? Some people fear death. Some people fear going in elevators. Some people uh, arachnophobia, fear of spiders. Some people fear bridges like me. I sometimes get nervous going over bridges since I was a kid when I'm driving over them. I feel kind of fear a little bit. But, you know, we think about what is the greatest fear that you have in your life. Some people, it's death. They fear death of what will happen. Well, in the entire Bible, the Word tells us, do you know that? The Word, the Bible, 365 times, the Word of God tells us not to fear not, fear not. 365 times in the Bible it says, fear not. Imagine that. So once for every day of the year, if you think about it, we don't have to fear because we know God's in control. And of course, where is the fear of death? We have the victory in Christ over death. We know we have eternal life. Well, here's the setting. Shepherds are washing their flocks at night, right? Um, and, and there was a risk associated with guarding the sheep you know, with wolves, coyotes, things of that nature. And maybe, you know, of course, there's a bit of fear since there was no artificial light, there was no electricity then. They didn't have flashlights, you know, they, they might have had a lamp, an oil lamp, possibly, you know, they do have the oil or candle, but with wind and who knows, they can blow up. But so, so typically, you know, there was no, people just had these oil lamps and there was no really light at night, maybe from the moon, of course, if there was a full moon. So, and as for these shepherds working in this field, right, this was not a very pleasant or honorable job. Matter of fact, it was kind of a peasant type of work, a dirty job, but someone's going to do it, right? And so sometimes that happens. Well, Dr. Luke in his gospel declared to these shepherds in the fields to what? Fear not. Fear. Do not fear. You know, and this is, again, 365 times in the Bible it talks about this. And throughout the Bible... It tells us, you know, not to fear. But, of course, just like, you know, Ruby said, you can, you know, if an angel appeared to you in your room here or somewhere, you'd be like, whoa, you know, yeah, you, you might be very fearful. You might be afraid, you know, what happened there. But, you know, this wasn't the first time. And it also happened to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1, 13, previously, in the previous chapter. In Luke chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, But the angel said to him, this is to Zechariah. Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and she call his name John. Of course, now this is John the Baptizer, and of course, this was Elizabeth who was barren for many, many years. They were trying to have a child, but guess what? The angel of God came and said, "Don't be afraid. Do not fear." You know, I remember the uh, remember the show when I was a kid. It's called Underdog. Remember that cartoon? It says, there's no need to fear. Underdog is here. And he'd fly out and he'd save the day. Well, we can change the G and the D of an underdog. We can say, there's no need to fear. God is here. Under God is here. We are under God when it comes. And when we're under God, we don't need to fear because God's got us. He's not going to leave us and forsake us. We're in his hands. No matter what happens in this world, guess what? Even death. We go to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, Apostle Paul said. So again, Dr. Luke in his gospel declares to fear not. Jesus, what does he do? He removes fear from us. He gives us peace. And the things we need not to fear is death, hell, Satan. We don't have to fear of all things in life that people will attack us. Don't need to fear at all. Matter of fact, um, when it came to Joseph, also, the angel visited someone who was Joseph. Joseph. Joseph was betrothed to Mary. He was engaged to Mary. They were a very young couple. And usually in those days, the marriages were fixed by the parents. So when they were very, very young, they were chosen to be married to each other. Well, look what happened in, in Matthew. As uh, Matthew recorded this in chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. And Matthew recorded this about this 
what happened to Joseph. And so, and her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. He was not willing to divorce her because she could technically be stung from becoming pregnant, right, in those days. Not, you know, from another man because, they, you know, just like today, oh yeah, I'm sure you're pregnant by the Holy Ghost. You know, you know, it takes two to tangle. So, you know, so he could have put her and divorced her and he, she could have been stoned to death. But in Matthew 1 verse 20, Matthew records this. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not what? Fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So prior to this, you can imagine the situation, the shame in the town of Bethlehem, right? And Joseph and Edith, they're not married yet, and they didn't consummate the marriage, so what's going on? Why is she pregnant? You know, but she might have been ridiculed, attacked, and who knows what. And Joseph was at a point where he's struggling in his mind. Do I divorce her? Do I turn her in to get her stoned because she's pregnant? No. The Holy Spirit, the angel of God came and verified to Joseph, this is of the Holy Spirit. And that's what he, the angel did to Mary and also to Elizabeth, saying, do not fear. Do not fear man. Do not fear what man can do to you, but, but fear what God can do to your soul eternally. And so, first of all, this is a, an important message where, again, it talks about a comforting message. When it comes to us, when it comes to this time of the year, the season in Christ, what comforts you? People seek a lot of different things to take away fear or take away physical fear or pain. They'll use whatever kind of drugs or different things, pornography or escapism or you know hobbies or idolatry to escape the reality of the life we live in this earth where our sin nature wants to take over and demons and the devil wants us to be misled and, and follow our own decisions and consequences of bad choices. Well... God's saying, no, no. This is a message that says He wants to comfort us. To re he removes fear. And the only way we can do that is we trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Very important. He wants to bring us comfort to fear not and consider these things as well. And that means we have to take a time to pray. Take a time for each one of us to say, Lord, you know, why am I going through this, Lord? I need your help. Talk to our Lord, those watching at home. You know, do not fear. But bring you know, the true comfort comes from where? Comes from our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the comfort we need. And so again, as these shepherds needing comforting because there was some fear, you know, out in the fields, you know, it's at night, and this angel bright shining, you know, whoa, whoa, what's going on? You know, it says, fear not. Fear not. Be comforted knowing that the Savior is finally coming. The Roman, Roman, you know, the Roman, uh, you know, what do you call it, empire that's been oppressing people and controlling them and paying taxes, and all this stuff like today. We've got to pay taxes, we've got all this got to do for the government, all this stuff. Well, guess what? In the theocracy, not democracy, theocracy, meaning God's theocracy, theo meaning God, opracy of Him, we don't have to worry about tax, all those things that we do about this world because when the new Jerusalem comes down, he comes down and he's in control, he's in charge, he's, he's the Lord of the Lord, King of Kings. It's his way or the highway, that's it. We can be rest assured that things will be in order, there'll be no more corruption, no more you know, uh, uh, false political gain and all this other garbage out there that is leadership in our countries. It'll only be Jesus as Lord and every knee shall bow and confess him as Lord and Savior. And that to me is comforting, knowing that Jesus gives us true joy, true peace through Him. Our second point is this. We know, first we looked at a comforting message. Secondly, the point is this. It's a salvation message. The Lord God and the angels are bringing this salvation message. Look at verse 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, again, for behold, I bring you what? Good news, of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. There is a salvation message that has three parts in verse 10 and 11. First of all, it's good news. This first point is good news, sub point good news. What is good news? Tidings of comfort and joy. Tidings, that's good news. Tidings is what? Is notifications. They are notifications. And the Greek word, believe it or not, for tidings or good news is 
evangelizo, where we get the word evangelize. The Greek word is evangelizo. And the English word today is evangelize or evangelism. So when we go to evangelize, we're doing what? Bringing good news, tidings of joy, tidings of the, the words of the Savior. And we see that in Matthew 4, 23, it says, And he went through all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Gospel is what? Good news. Evangelizo. Bringing the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And so again, here is Christ. He's bringing a salvation message like the angels are pronouncing Christ is going to be the Savior and the salvation. And he, they're bringing, so the angels here are bringing good news to these shepherds in the fields. Secondly, the salvation message is what? It's universal. When we see it says to great joy, what? To all people. So that word great is mega and joy is kara, or a charisma, right? Favor. So mega, so great is mega, where we get, you know, we get mega buildings, mega millions, the lottery, mega million lottery, right? You go by numbers when you try to win the lottery, which is a million to one odds of that. Uh, so anyway, so we got mega and we got kara, mega kara, great joy to who? To all people. And that word in Greek is pas laos, pas laos, which is what? The general world populace. That's what it's talking about to all people. Now, salvation is there, but there are few. But remember, the world is brought in water to destruction where many follow the path of the wrong directions by deceived and not God's chosen elect. And there's those who are those few who God draws and calls, opens their eyes spiritually. They repent, they turn to Christ, and they accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And those are the ones who are more specific grace, the specific great salvation message. So the second salvation message is universal. And then thirdly, we find in verse 10 and 11, it's a personal message. Salvation message is personal. Unto what? It says right there in verse 11. For unto you. Now the angels are saying to who? Unto you. That means to those shepherds. It's made personal. Salvation, Mariana says to people, said, well, you know, it's not about religion. It's not traditions of man or some denomination or some other thing. You may go to a church building or pews or chairs or wherever you may be. Salvation is a personal relationship, isn't it? It's about that relationship with the Lord. So for unto you, you in Greek, in Greek is pronounced su, su, it's coming, usted, su, su quieres. You know, that's not in Spanish they use that word, but that's what it means, unto you is, is su. So the good news is addressed personally and specifically to the shepherds overseeing these flocks. You see, here's the bottom line. Salvation is what? Of only who? Of Jesus the Christ. Not made by religion, no works, nor anything on earth will bring about salvation. Only in Christ is there salvation, and his salvation is personal. And what is it? The greatest gift from God. People prepare all kinds of gifts to give to other people for Christmas. You want to give up, you know, it's a great time of joy and family and everything else. But really, the greatest gift for this time of the season is to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. He is the greatest gift. And notice we move on in verse 11. There are threefold titles given to Jesus. Threefold in verse 11. First of all, the title is Savior. That Greek, in the Greek, it's soter. It means to rescue, to deliver. So the first title used in verse 11 is Savior. And of course, what is this picture? Well, eventually we know that he came, went to the cross. He went as a sacrifice. He was the deliverer from the oppression of the Roman Empire and the Jewish legalistic control upon the Jewish people. Excuse me. And because we know the religious spirit that they had, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, the high priests and their families, they were always trying to oppress people and put burdens upon them. You've got to do this. You can't do that. You've got to do this. No, you can't do that. You can only walk so many steps on the Sabbath and it's considered work and then you're, you broke the Sabbath. It was crazy, all the pharmaceutical legalism that was happening. And so finally, he's a savior. We needed him to come and save us from all these things and man-made works and self-righteousness, trying to appease God in our own works, which the Word of God says, you're saved by grace through faith, not a works that any man should boast. It is the gift of God, charis, the gift of God. And so, again, first of all, he is the Savior. And more importantly, he is the rescuer or the deliverer from the account of sin. Well, how does he do that? Well, in Christ's incarnation, where he came physically into the earth through Mary, 
into this world through a sinner Mary, placed in a manger, feeding trough for animals. And you would think, well, how in the world? That was not what many people expected, right? They expected that the King David kind of king to come in and wipe out the Roman Empire, wipe out all the enemies, and, and rule and reign and bring peace to the land. Well, that's not the way Jesus first came. He'll come back the second way that way. But the first time he came as a suffering servant, he was a humble, humble Lord who came down to show love, mercy, compassion. And of course, he knew that his destiny was the cross where he would be beaten, whipped, abused, and, and he, he took upon all our sin on, on account fully in God's wrath of what was poured upon his son on the cross. And that's the rest of the story. Jesus was to be distant to, to be slaughtered as the Lamb of God, the Savior of his chosen people. So he was the Savior in that first title used in verse 11. In verse 11 of our text, the second title is Christ. The Greek is Christos, which means what? The anointed one, the Son of God. So this pictures him as the fulfillment of all the promises and prophecies beginning in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.15, where it talks about the first sacrificial blood offering, right? The ribbon of blood. And so he was secondly called Christ, the crystal, the anointed one. And then the third title that they used, and then not only Savior Christ, in verse 11 of Luke 2, but the third title was Lord. And Lord in the Greek is what? Kyrios. It's, it, English you kind of pronounce it's like K-Y-R-I-O-S, but it's not the Greek letters, but it's pronounced Kyrios, which means what? Sovereign God. And what does it mean when he's Lord? It's a lordship. It's one who exercises supernatural authority over mankind. He's a lord, a ruler, one who commands, like a military term. He's a commander. He's the commander-in-chief, like I said, the president of the United States is the commander-in-chief. You have colonels, you have generals. They're in a point of authority. And of course, that's what Christ is. He's the sovereign God. He is charged. He is in Lord. He exercised supernatural authority over this world. He created it. He was in the beginning. Look, John 1.1, 1, 1, right? He is the one to be served, worshipped, and adored. You know, I want to share this with you. Jesus is called Savior. Not an example of a teacher, but a Savior. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent an entertainer. If our greatest need had been military, God would have sent a soldier. If our greatest need had been for justice, God would have sent a judge. Well, what is the greatest need for mankind? Salvation. Amen. Forgiveness and redemption, and therefore God sent a Savior. We needed, grace need is forgiveness, redemption, and of course, which leads to Christ for salvation. And let me ask you a question, those who are here watching at home. Have you been forgiven by the Lord for your sins? It's time to realize we are all sinners needing the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah, and today, I challenge you, if you have not received God's salvation, forgiveness of sins, will you call upon Him for forgiveness today? Today is the day. It's the first day of the rest of your life. We don't know what tomorrow brings. You could be dead tomorrow. But today, you must confess Him as Lord of your life. You believe God raised from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Third point this morning is, when it talks about the angel bringing the message, it's, it's called a showing message. It's called a showing message, that salvation. The angel was bringing a showing message. What did the showing message do? It pointed the way to Jesus. It was what? It was a sign for the world to follow. A sign. You know, I remember in 1971, you know, I'm a musician and I play music and I like that as well, but it was a song that came out by the Five Man Electrical Band. That's the name of the band, 1971. The Five Man Electrical Band wrote a song called Signs. And some of the lyrics go, sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Can't you read the signs? Well, let me ask you a question. Are you seeing the signs revealing the message of Christ? Are we living in the last days before the return of the Lord? I say, yes, we are. You watching at home, do you realize right now we're seeing signs and things of wonders that are happening throughout the world? Pestilence, earthquake, violence, covid uh, you know, wars, rumors of wars. We see all these signs that Jesus spoke about, Matthew 24 and Luke 13, regarding the evidence that we can clearly see that God is showing us the signs of His return. 
where the manger, Christ coming and born in a feeding trough in a manger. These were signs that the angels were pointing them to show them that. And of course, God word, God's word, the Bible is pointing the way. Every now and then, we may encounter someone who needs the way pointed out to them, right? What, we, what do we do? Well, we show them, okay, this is the way to go. We point them. Oh, yeah, you're looking for that store at Myers. Yeah, it's down the street. You go down here, you take a left on Pennell Boulevard, and it's right, it'll, be on, it'll be on the left, and that, that's where the, you know, or whatever road is. You know, that's where you're going to find. We point the person to the direction. We, as ambassadors of Christ, we are sojourners. We are saints, messengers of God, if you will. We go out and also point others to who? To Christ. To Christ. Because we can't save them. We can pray all we want for them. God has to draw them to the truth, open their eyes, and draw them and, and realize and convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's the reality. So, the showing message. The angels come and show them, hey, this will be a sign. You will see, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This is a sign for who? Sign for you. Making it personal again to the shepherds but also for us in general today. There was a sign. Jesus had come into this world, and it was an incredible, powerful sign, a showing message. So the angelic host, and this host meeting there is army. It's an army of angels, points the shepherds, showing them the way, giving a sign, giving direction to what? To the main point of focus. That is to arrive at their destination. Point in the direction, and there is Mary, Joseph, and there's the baby Jesus, the Savior of the world in the manger. What a humble way to come into the world, amen? I mean, you would think this King of kings and Lord of lords would come, you know, with the red carpet rolled out and, okay, here he is. You know, that's what a lot of the Pharisees and Sadducees and the, all the legalistic, you know, Jewish rules and regulation religion of man were expecting. But no, he came and was born by these two people that we a lot of Jerusalem, they went to Bethlehem, humble Joseph, humble Mary, Jewish boy and girl, and God used this humble Jewish woman full of grace, full of favor of God, to usher and bring in Jesus into the world. Amazing, powerful thing. It was a humble thing. It was a, a wonderful thing to point to. Not what man expects, but the way God does things. So this showing message. And you know that Greek word for sign is simeo, an event with what? Special meaning. So this sign that they gave with the manger and pointing them to the direction, it had very special meaning. To the world today, Jesus isn't about Christmas. Why? Christmas is about buying stores, hurry up, go there, do this, get the ham, get the food ready, do all this stuff. But Jesus is in the background. The devil wants to not put the focus and point us to Jesus, he wants us to point of the gifts and Christmas trees and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and snowmen and elves and dwarfs and everything else. Yeah, Santa Claus. Santa Claus didn't die for any of us. Jesus alone died for us. That's where it needs to point to. That's the sign. The birth and event of Christ was truly an event with very special meaning. And even what? I told you about Mary pondered the event. In Luke 2, 19, but Mary treasured up all these things Pondering them in her heart. Pondering is what? It's considering the implications of all the issues at hand. That's what she was doing. And you know, another interesting part, where did Christ become incarnate into our world? Where was the city? Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means? In Hebrew, Beth is home and Lachem is bread. So Bethlehem is house of what did Jesus call himself? In John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So we see Jesus, how, you know, not coincidence, I don't believe any coincidences at all, Jesus being born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, and the later says to himself, I am the bread of life. Powerful. So God revealed the bread of life in the house of bread, town of Bethlehem. And the angel of the Lord showed the way to the sign of the Christ in a manger. Thus the sign of the Christ, the Messiah, is present in the world. He's now come into the world. 
The long-awaited King and Savior has arrived for the Lord's chosen people to redeem them and rescue them. You know, if you think about this, there are many various types of man-made and God-made as well as spiritual signs that point to something or someone, right? A sign for this typically to do what? To advertise some kind of product. You need this new car. You need this. You need to buy that. You know, how, you can't live without this, this cookie car. You can't live without this, you know, Kenmore, you know, dishwasher or this thing and that. Advertisements all the time, you know, for beer, this, that, cigarettes used to be all the time. The, the Paul Mall man, right? And the, or the, the Marlboro man, and all the advertising with the cowboy hat, and, you know. All these kind of signs and signs they would give you all the time, pointing you to go buy something. Well, are you reading and following the signs today? The signs of the times we are living in, are you, are you understanding them? You see, now is the time today to accept the truth of Christ. And let me ask you this question. Is God leading you to the bread of life? It's time to now to return to Bethlehem, to the house of bread. Fourth and final point is this. The angels brought a shouting message. The angels brought a shouting message. The angels praised their creator. But I ask you a question. What does praise and glory mean? What does it mean? Well, praise in, in the intent of the Bible is to to have approval, to compliment, to admire, to worship. That's what praise means. And what about the word glory? You know, I remember there's a song written way back, I think in the 80s, Bruce Springsteen wrote a song, Glory Days. You know, I think it's talking about the old days of the past. You know, we sometimes say, oh, boy, it wasn't that day when I was growing up, you know. They don't make cars like they used to, right? You have those, they don't do that like they used to. Those glory days, right, when you were younger and mm -hmm. things were so different. And we do, and I, I feel the same way sometimes. In the 60s, 70s, growing up, it wasn't that way. We didn't have technical cell phones. We could out and have fun and, and go roll out in the snow and have fun with the kids, ride our bikes. And those are the glory days, right? And we remember those days. Well, when it comes to here in this passage in 13, and multitude of heavenly hosts bringing God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, this glory. Was, it's, it's defined here in the Bible as magnificence, splendor, wonder, fame. It was a very powerful, glorious event when the angels came and appeared. And then he showed them the Christ born in a manger. Dr. Luke here shares the splendorous moment of the multitude of angels praising God. I mean, an army, a host, and glorifying him for what? For a supernatural manifestation of God's love. And what does it mean to glory? It's to praise to God. And it says also that praise to God and peace to man. Glory in Greek is doxa, where we get the term doxology, where we bring a doxology, a type of praise, a glorious moment of doxology, of thanks, right? So Jesus came to give man peace with God, peace with God, a general type of peace, right? Salvation. And then a specific, and peace within. True believers, think about this. Jesus gives us peace, not like man gives, but only he can give. And that gives us a blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Remember that song? I love that song. Jesus can give me peace. In John 14, 27, he says this. Peace I leave you with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be Afraid is that fear thing again. Don't be afraid. The peace I give you is not like this world peace. You know, people want to have peace deals. Peace deals in Israel between Hamas and the Palestinians and the Jewish people. Peace, peace, peace. But they keep all these peace deals. They broke it at five times, the Hamas. They, you know, what kind of peace deal is that? It didn't work out very good because they want to destroy the truth. They want to destroy the Jews, Christians. They hate the infidels. That's us. We're, we're Christians. They, they want to murder us Muslims. They don't like us. Why? Because the devil rules them. We are the true God. If our faith was not true, it was just a lie, and well, the Bible's not true, then why would they bother if they say it's not the real Jesus and the King? Why would they come and attack us? You see, because it is the truth. And the devil doesn't like it. The devil knows he's going to lose in the long run. But we have the victory in Jesus, and we overcome by the blood of the Lamb of our testimony, and that's through the power of God on the cross. It started at a manger, but it started actually in the beginning when Jesus created everything. But he came into this world in a manger, a feeding trough, as a suffering, humble servant, as a baby. But it didn't end there. He went to the cross to give us true peace. 
Apostle Paul wrote of the peace that only comes from our Lord God in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Philippians 4 through 7. And he said this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Not in Buddha, not in Obi-Wan Kenobi, not in Mohammed, not in Confucius, but only in Christ Jesus. And Apostle Paul wrote to the Roman church regarding peace. What did he say in Romans chapter 5, verses 1? Therefore, since we have been justified, what? By faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 2 of Romans 5. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of our God. There it is. Peace, hope, love, glory, all that through there. Praise and honor, and we glorify our Lord. So here it is. The shepherd, upon seeing the sign of the angel, revealed the true glory and peace of the Lord, right? As eyewitnesses to the truth of God incarnate, seeing that baby. You know, when it comes to us in today's world, we go to football games, you see the Bengals play, right? Everyone's, you know, you go to a stadium. You, I know I've been to one sly sports game, but it can get loud. People are shouting, I mean, seriously, for their team. Roaring around, yeah, come on, come on. They're praising, you know, these, it's kind of really kind of an idolatry to think about it. But they're praising the team, come on, cheering them on, cheering them on. Come on, come on, praising them. Yeah, the Bengals, all right, yeah, yeah. Well, in reality is, how come we don't fill stadiums to praise the Lord Jesus Christ? People will go to Buffalo, these cold places, in the cold and sit in stadiums, freezing, full of snow and rain and everything else, and they'll still there there in their, their idolatry and praising that team and, yeah, root, root for them. But you come to a church building and three, four, no one wants to stand up and shout for Jesus. Well, I say we need to stand up, not only praise and glorify Him, but shout, spread the word of God, continue to go forth and boldly confess Jesus as Lord. Boldly say the shouting message to tell others that we need to truly reach and be the, be the messengers, the ambassadors of Christ in this world. You see, the birth of Christ in total admiration and magnificence deserves complete admiration. And let me ask you a question. Do you understand the true depth of the incarnation of Christ? Do you understand the depth that God, fully God, fully human, coming into a body to, to the Lord? And my question is, are you shouting out the message of the newborn king? You see, Christ is the only hope for you in this world and beyond the grave. My question is for those watching at home here, are you a believer? Do you believe in Christ? Have you submitted to the Lord in your life? Is God drawing you now? into a relationship with Him. That's the message. The first message of one of part three where this is a good news message of salvation and peace. Are you saved? Do you have peace knowing you have eternal life? If you don't, today's the day, the first day of the rest of your lives to make a decision to come to the saving grace of Christ. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, that only through you there is salvation and true peace. You came down to a manger. You came down to give us true peace, true rest. And Lord, the angel pointed the shepherds to that manger, to that newborn child, the Savior. Father, help the Holy Spirit in our lives to point us and keep us focused on Christ, not only in the manger, but where he went to his destiny on the cross. Help us to remember whose child you are and whose name we bear, that we come to you only through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, Holy Spirit, guide us. Help us during this time of this season to remember the greatest gift of mankind is you. Father, I pray for those who don't know Christ as Lord and Savior to really come to that true rest, the only rest and peace and salvation that comes from you. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen and amen. <laughs> Last song, there are seven verses. God rest you, merry gentlemen. Let nothing you dismay or fear. Christ is born on Christmas Day to save us from Satan's power when we've gone astray. Let's sing, God rest you, merry gentlemen. God
God rest ye merry gentlemen let nothing you dismay remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power when we're gone astray oh tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy oh tidings of comfort and joy in Bethlehem in Jury this blessed
I can do that. 